Welcome. Welcome to uh, yet another, I believe the fifth session of Old Testament survey. Oh, okay, uh, Donna says something about Facebook so she can share it. I'm not sure what's happening and I'm recording. <laughs> okay, here we are in uh, session five of Old Testament survey. We've gotten a start in Genesis. We spent two sessions so far in this uh, big important book of Genesis. Uh, we're all the way up into chapter two. We ended uh, the uh, last session uh, with a, a discussion of the seven days of creation. Uh, I emphasized that the seven days were really seven days. There's, there's nothing magical, there's nothing mystical about these. Uh, the uh, secular view that uh, the earth is many, many billions of years old uh, is simply not supported by the biblical text. Uh, Christians who, um, who think about these things need to make a decision uh, whether they're, uh, they're going to believe the, uh, the secular theories or they're going to believe what the Bible actually says. The secular theories change from time to time. Um, 200 years ago, virtually everyone believed that the earth was relatively young. Uh, today, virtually everyone believes that the earth is very, very old. Well, who was right? Uh, the evidence hasn't changed very much. Uh, the interpretation of the evidence has changed. Uh, and if you begin with the presupposition that there is not and never has been a God, then creation, of course, is impossible. Uh, and only some kind of evolution of the universe can explain its existence. The fact that evolution doesn't explain the existence of the universe doesn't seem to deter the critics. They, they continue to believe what they believe, uh, whether it can be demonstrated to be true or not. Uh, those of us who know Christ know that God does in fact exist. Uh, we know that he is infinitely powerful, that by his creative word, he caused us to pass from death to life. Uh, he, by his creative word, uh, he raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, everything that Jesus tells us is true. Uh, Jesus believed uh, that uh, the, uh, the earth was created in seven days, uh, that, uh, that uh, Adam and Eve were real people in a real garden who committed a real sin that had to be atoned for by a real death. Uh, Jesus taught the truth. So I believe those things uh, because I believe in God, because, I, uh, because I'm a child of God through the power of Christ. I have no trouble at all uh, believing what Genesis actually says. Uh, sometimes I have questions about how exactly to put it together, uh, but because I believe in Christ, I have no trouble at all uh, believing that uh, Genesis is giving us history. So as we pass from chapter one of Genesis to chapter two, we're seeing what uh, some would call a, a second creation account. Now it isn't really, um, on the other hand, it uh, definitely does seem to be written by uh, a different hand, a different author. Uh, now, of course, uh, the, uh, all of Genesis was uh, compiled, it was put together uh, by Moses. Uh, so there's a, there's a Moses uh, character superimposed over the whole text of Genesis. I'm not questioning that. Uh, but what I am saying is that the Genesis 1 has a, uh, a, a formal, almost poetic uh, 
feel to it. Uh, it it moves along in very precisely linked uh, stanzas, and it goes from one, two, three, four, moves through the seven days of the creation week. Uh, there's uh, uh, there's an orderliness. There's a precision to the uh, to the Genesis flow in chapter one. When we get into chapter two, uh, we don't see that same kind of uh, uh, strict poetic movement. It's um, uh, it, it's a uh, more of a uh, of a prose lyrical storytelling. In uh, in Genesis two, we see the relationship of God uh, to Adam and Eve. So the creation of Adam, uh, the creation of Eve, the uh, beginning of marriage as an institution uh, are all given to us in the form of a story. One of the most important distinctions between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 uh, is the, uh, the difference in the name for God. In chapter 1, the Hebrew word is Elohim, which is the word that means God, the supreme being. Uh, it's, a, it's a generic term. We can use the word Elohim even for the pagan gods, uh, or El or Elim, something like that. The, the root is L, E-L. Uh, Elohim is a, is a plural form, which is interesting, but we don't need to worry about it right now. Uh, in chapter two of Genesis, Moses uses the name of God that was given to him on Mount Sinai, uh, which is Elohim, or not Elohim, Yahweh, uh, Y-H-W-H, the four letters of the name of God. Yahweh is God's personal name. Uh, in uh, the sense that my name is John, my wife's name is Donna, uh, I can see Oscar over here. Uh, Joel and Mike and Eddie have all got their uh, their videos muted. Uh, but we've got personal names. God has a personal name. If you wanted to uh, add a, uh, a contact for God on, in your uh, iPhone, uh, uh, his uh, his personal name would be Yahweh, uh, and his uh, business. Uh, would be God, creator, ruler of the universe, okay? Uh, and his phone number is pretty easy to find. You just talk and he has no trouble. And that difference of names doesn't mean two different gods. Uh, God is often called Yahweh Elohim. Uh, in our English Bibles, uh, the word uh, Elohim is usually translated God. The word Yahweh is usually translated Lord in all capital letters. And when the two are put together, which happens very frequently in the Old Testament, uh, is simply the Lord God. Uh, and so we see that phrase very, very frequently. Uh, the critics from oh, 150 years ago or so noticed this too. Everybody has always noticed this, but the critics 150 years ago said, this is evidence uh, that there are actually two different authors. There's a, uh, a J author, they were, they were German, and so instead of a Y, they used a J. There's a J author, uh, and there's an E author. The E author always called God Elohim, and the J author always called God uh, Jehovah or Yahweh. Uh, and uh, uh, then there was an editor who cut and pasted all of these things together so that every once in a while it comes out Yahweh Elohim, Lord God. Um, there's no evidence that anything like that ever happened. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, the real evidence, the, the actual hard evidence in the text, uh, suggests that uh, we've got something else going on entirely. Uh, let me get into, uh, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to open up my, maybe I won't, maybe I'll just use the, the notes here. 
Yes, this will work. That's all I need to do. And I don't need that at all. I bring this right over here. Oh, wow. Who knew? OK, so uh, we've got um, kind of a second account of, uh, uh, of the creation of man. The reason for a second account is that the man is the key to creation. Uh, man is the uh, uh, the ambassador of God, the the vicar of God on earth. Uh, the uh, uh, the creation of man is the uh, uh, climax of the creative week. Uh, and uh, in chapter two, we see a uh, an expansion of a development of. Uh, the sixth day of creation. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to start off right at uh, verse four. If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to have you look at that. Uh, I'm not going to put up my uh, my PowerPoint uh, right now. Well, uh, there, there's a uh, some stuff that I want to show you later, but uh, right now I'm not going to put up PowerPoint. Uh, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay, so there we have the summary that introduces the section. I'll mention just briefly, let me, uh, I guess I better show you a, the, um, the term generations in English is a translation of the Hebrew toledot. Toledot. Uh, the, uh, the word toledot uh, is a, uh, a Hebrew word that uh, derives from a word that means to, believe it or not, give birth. Uh, yalad is a, is a child or a newborn, or it can be a verb uh, yeah, in that it uh, 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 means to give birth, to raise a child. It, it, it is a fairly broadly used uh, word. And what, uh, what it means here is something like now here's what became of, or here's what comes after the heavens and the earth in the day that they were created. So uh, if you're wondering, what did the heaven and earth give birth to? That was kind of a strange way of thinking about it, but that's maybe the best way to, uh, to think about it. Uh, here we have uh, the generations, the toledote of the heavens and the earth. The, um, Interesting thing about that phrase, these are the generations, is that it recurs 10 times in the book of Genesis. And in fact, it appears to be the uh, marker that Moses uses uh, to move us from one account in Genesis to the next account. Uh, some scholars have suggested that there were uh, actually, originally 11 clay tablets that were passed down to Moses. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, there's no evidence to say one way or another how Moses got this information. Uh, it could be that God just gave him the information. But the Toledot passages do, in fact, happen. We see them uh, over and over in, uh, in the Bible or in Genesis. The rest of the Bible, this isn't used, only in Genesis. Uh, so it's entirely possible that this is the division of different documents that Moses actually used to create uh, the book of Genesis. Now, this is different from what is called by the critics the documentary hypothesis in that we actually believe that Moses wrote Genesis and that the original documents are also a part of the inspiration process. Uh, so I believe that Genesis 1, however it came down to Moses, uh, was uh, controlled by God. It was superintended by God 
so that it would be uh, uh, an accurate account of what actually happened. This is not different authors making up their own thing as they go along. So these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. Um, when uh, no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land uh, and a mist uh, or there was no man to work the ground. Uh, interesting, there are no plants in the field because one, it hadn't rained yet. And two, there was no man to work the ground. So God notes immediately after, you notice back in, uh, uh, in verse uh, uh, 31 of chapter one, when God looks at all that he had created, he said, uh, uh, behold, it is very good. Now, in order to get from where we are to uh, very good, we're going to walk through the, the chapter two session. Notice that uh, God notes a couple of deficiencies. Uh, there was nothing growing yet because it hadn't rained and there was no man to till the soil. As a matter of fact, a mist was going up from the land and watering the whole face of the ground very strange. Uh, we don't know exactly what that's talking about. Uh, there are a variety of hypotheses. Um, you, you can look online to see what everybody says. Uh, the, the key thing is that it, it wasn't raining. Uh, and yet there, there was moisture available. There was a mist that went up from the ground and that would be enough for things to grow if there was a man to till the soil. And so the, the, uh, the idea that there's no rain is later on going to pop up during the time of the flood. Uh, and that, that becomes a really interesting concept uh, uh, because it appears that uh, the rain at the time of Noah's flood is a major surprise to everybody. Okay. Be that as it may. Uh, we also see there's no man yet. And what was man's purpose? To till the soil. Uh, Adam was designed to be the keeper of a garden. That was his job. Uh, and here we, um, we see the description of that. So this mist is going up and the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground. Okay, uh, this is verses uh, six and seven. He formed the man of dust from the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. So look at what's, uh, what's going on here. Uh, the Lord God formed the man Secondly, he breathed life into him and the summary statement. And so man became a living creature. That wouldn't describe evolution at all. If this is an accurate description of what happened on the sixth day of creation, uh, then there was no evolution at all. The evolutionists typically uh, speak of the evolution of man as uh, some kind of development from uh, other animals, usually uh, from the apes. Uh, and so some great ape crawled down out of his tree, uh, thumped himself on the chest and said, today I am a man. Uh, and at that point, uh, the, uh, the monkey became a man uh, and, uh, and he picked another monkey to marry and she became Eve and the two of them uh, went on into history as Adam and Eve. Uh, not so much. Here's the biggest problem with that. Uh, at the point that God formed the man out of the dust of the earth, he didn't form him out of 
pre-existing living stuff. He didn't take a hamster and make it into a man or an elephant or a monkey. Uh, he formed man out of the dust of the earth. He formed Eve from the side of Adam, which is again a fascinating concept. We'll look at that in a moment. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the description of the creation is of uh, entirely different substance than the evolutionary hypothesis. Uh, and then the verb here, and man became a living creature. Uh, there was no life in man prior to God breathing life into him. All life comes from God. Uh, and the image here is very direct, very distinct of God breathing life into this uh, dirt boy that he had made. He formed the dirt into a man. Uh, and the, uh, the dust boy, the dirt boy that he had just made, he breathes life into. And so Adam stands up a living being. There is, there's no room. There's no hint of evolution here. There, uh, none of that is, uh, uh, is uh, allowable. Uh, there's no intermediary life forms. God didn't create life at the beginning of creation billions of years before and a long string of life uh, that finally ended up in, uh, in Adam. Uh, there, there's no biblical uh, data that can be understood in that way. Uh, I know there are, there are groups out there uh, who teach otherwise. There are commentators who teach otherwise. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, I, will, uh, I will debate any of them who have the courage to do that. Uh, so the creation of man is uh, actually a special thing. I believe that man was created uh, on the sixth day of creation. So that is roughly 6,000 to 10,000 years ago not millions of years ago, but six to 10,000 years ago. I think 10,000 is probably on the high end, 6,000 is a little on the low end. Uh, somewhere in between is probably about right. There are some, uh, some questions we have about the very earliest chronologies of uh, Genesis that I won't, I won't spend a lot of time boring you with. Um, but six to 10,000 years is about right. So man is created in uh, uh, verse uh, eight, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, people ask me sometimes, where was the Garden of Eden? Is it in Mesopotamia or someplace in India? Uh, undoubtedly some beautiful place in the Amazon jungle. Where was, the, where was the Garden of Eden? And the simple answer is, we don't know where the Garden of Eden was. Uh, the, uh, the biblical narrative takes us from the Garden of Eden through several thousand years down to the time of the flood when there was a catastrophic change in the entire surface of the earth. Uh, and so any place that we might have been able to find prior to the flood is no longer there. It's buried by uh, several kilometers of sedimentary rock and everything is moved around and the continents drifted. Uh, and there's all kinds of changes that have taken place. Uh, and so for us to say, well, that's it. That's, you know, the Garden of Eden is in this uh, 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 water park outside of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, uh, that's, that's silly. Some years ago, there was a, a group in Israel that bought some land just south of uh, the Sea of Galilee. And they ran water from the Jordan River uh, up into pools and slides and all kinds of things. They made a, a Garden of Eden water slide park uh, for, uh, uh, for Israeli families. Uh, I've never been there. Uh, it, 
you know, I've, I've never had a group that would appreciate a water slide park. Uh, but uh, from my point of view, uh, that makes as much sense as any place else. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, it, yeah, it's probably not in Israel. It's probably not in Iraq. It's, it's not any of these places. Some of the, the names of places, uh, we, we have uh, Tigris, Euphrates, and, and uh, Gihon are mentioned. But I think those, uh, uh, those river names are applied um, uh, anachronistically uh, out of their, uh, their, their right place. It, I can explain that separately if we need to. So the Lord God planted a garden. And in the midst of that garden, uh, all kinds of trees are growing up, all kinds of trees and plants, uh, everything that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So the trees are going to be good for food. God has already given uh, man, uh, male and female, Adam and Eve, uh, the plants of uh, of the uh, uh, or the fruit of the trees as uh, as food. Here, that's repeated. This is this second uh, account. We're also given the detail that the tree of life is in the midst of the garden. Later on, we're going to find that the tree of life is a fairly important symbolic uh, item. Uh, I believe that the tree of life is actually present in the garden. Uh, there, there are, I know, there are commentators out there uh, who believe that the tree of life is merely symbolic of God's gift of life. Uh, I say, uh, God bless you, maybe that's true. Uh, it certainly is symbolic of life, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not a real tree. I, I think there was a real tree in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life uh, shows up again at the end of the book of Revelation, when we see the creation of a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem in the midst of this new heaven and earth, uh, we see the tree of life next to the river that runs through the middle of the, uh, of the city. So the tree of life is uh, a part of the, the, the paradise image. Uh, so God created a paradise on earth, the Garden of Eden. He will again recreate uh, a paradise uh, for his believers uh, forever and ever. Uh, that's, a, that's a part of heaven. Uh, the important theological truth in the Tree of Life is the access to eternal life. Uh, the... Uh, the presence of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden meant that uh, Adam and Eve would have access to life forever. Uh, the, uh, and this wasn't a mechanical thing. It wasn't some kind of magic fruit that would keep them alive forever. It was, it was rather symbolic of their relationship to God and uh, his presence with them there in the garden. And this uh, all put together was a, uh, the foundation of eternal life. And this is what Adam and Eve lost uh, when they sinned. So the tree of life was in the midst and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now that one is going to be a problem later on in the next chapter. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is symbolic of the knowledge of sin. Uh, in a perfect universe, uh, uh, Adam and Eve had just been created, and they were they were perfect people in a perfect universe. Uh, there was no sin, there was no temptation, there was there was nothing wrong about the world. God had just said, uh, "Everything is very good." Uh, how how would you ever know what evil is? Uh, some some philosophers have uh, have argued that uh, the knowledge of good and evil is a matter of contrast. God is infinitely perfect and good and perfect. He is he is holy, uh, uh, and throughout all of eternity past, he has always been holy. Evil can be understood as the absence of holiness, the absence of goodness. 
uh, it can be understood as the contrast to goodness. Uh, so a knowledge of good and evil is in fact possible by developing a working knowledge of the good. So if you get to know who God is and what God is like uh, in an in-depth relationship over a long period of time, uh, it would stand to reason that by applying the rule of contrast, you would know the opposite. You, you would know that sin is the absence of all of this goodness. Again, there's no magic in the fruit. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, it's traditional to think of it as an apple, but the Bible doesn't say. Uh, it could have been anything. Uh, it may well have been a mango. Who knows? We don't know. Could have been grapes, <laughs> but it doesn't say. Uh, and, uh, and there's nothing in the fruit uh, that explains it. The, the issue is the obedience to God. So. Uh, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. There it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon, and it flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of the land is good, but Delium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So there we have some, some basic stuff. Uh, we, uh, we don't know uh, the, uh, the location of these four rivers today. We know that the Tigris and Euphrates are, uh, are named after these paradise rivers. Uh, the uh, the Pishon has no contemporary naming. The Gihon is the uh, the name of the the spring that uh, gushes out at the uh, the foot of the Temple Mount on the south side, uh, the water system for Jerusalem. Um, so they don't all come from the same headwaters in in Armenia as uh, Tigris and Euphrates do. Uh, at any rate, the point of, uh, uh, of the man was to work the garden. He put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. Uh, understand that man's work was intended as a blessing. Uh, God didn't want Adam to be bored. He didn't want him to sit and worry. <laughs> so he gave him work to do. Uh, till the soil, work the garden, keep the soil cultivated and keep the trees happy and trim and prune and do what you do with trees and pick the fruit, eat the fruit, do the stuff that will happen in a garden uh, in order to keep it all good. <coughs> a man is given a job to do, the work is a blessing. Uh, in our modern world, we continue to understand. Most of us understand that work is a blessing. Uh, to be able to go to work, accomplish some task, uh, provide for our families. This this is what well, particularly this is what men are called to do. But in the in the modern world, many women are working outside the home as well. Uh, Eve had her own projects, and yet uh, Eve's, uh, Eve's commission is somewhat different than Adam's commission, and we'll talk about that as we go just a little farther into this. In verse uh, 16, the Lord God commanded the man. So here's, uh, uh, here's the command. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, there's, a, there's the first giving of a law. Now, you'll, you'll notice a, a couple of things here. The law uh, was given to Adam, who was at this time... Um, 
close enough for all practical purposes, a saved man. So Adam was someone who knew God, was a believer, uh, and already stood in a right relationship to God. The law was not intended as a means of Adam's salvation. I'm going to repeat that because it is so important. The law was not intended as the means of Adam's salvation. Uh, Old Testament law was never meant as a means of salvation. The law was always meant as uh, a, a blessing for believers. Let me uh, let me show you a, an image here and see if this uh, this is helpful. I'm going to see if I can get a whiteboard to come up and we'll we'll do another another thing. Years ago, uh, my uh, my wife and I had uh, had a house fire and we needed to have a have a, a place to stay for the winter. Uh, and um, let's see if I can make this go away. That doesn't need to go away. This does. Uh, and we were we were given a uh, a place on uh, on a lake. And that's a strange color for a lake. So we'll we'll do some blue. And there was an inlet to this lake. I, and uh, there was an outlet at the other side. But most of the uh, most of the water that came into the lake came from underground, and they were in the form of uh, springs. Well. Uh, we were given a uh, uh, a lake place to uh, to use during that first winter after our house burned, uh, and as the winter went along, the lake froze, and solid ice, and uh, uh, the kids wanted to learn to ice skate, and we wanted to teach them how to ice skate. Uh, so uh, Donna and I went out on the lake with our ice skates to to check out the place. And one of the things that we noticed was that in all of the places where there were springs, we could we could see them on the surface. Uh, they formed uh, dark areas, dark central areas, uh, surrounded by sometimes little cracks. Uh, and sometimes not. A dark area in the ice was where the ice was thin. Sometimes on warmer periods, you would even see a little bit of open water and it would be surrounded by an area with cracks in it. Uh, and we explored around and we found uh, uh, quite a few of these or at least half a dozen that we mapped out. Uh, and uh, so when we got back uh, uh, to the dock, we told the kids that we could go out, and um, oh, here's our uh, here's our dock, and we could leave the dock, and we could uh, we could skate wherever we wanted to on this lake. We could skate all around the lake. Uh, we could skate anywhere we wanted to, as long as we stayed away from the weak spots. Uh, for in the day that you go into one of these weak spots, uh, you will surely splash. You'll go through the, uh, the, uh, the ice and you'll end up in the water and we'll have to come out and rescue you and that will mess up the whole afternoon. Uh, so the, the rule was if you want the blessing of access to the whole lake anytime you want to go, you're going to have to follow this, uh, uh, this, uh, this law. Here is a place you don't want to go. Uh, what God did with the, uh, the giving of this law about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, is called apodictic law. I guess I should, I guess I should write that one on the on the board. Apodictic. 
it is a negative command made from two words. Dictus is uh, uh, to speak and apa is against. So a prohibition, a negative command, thou shalt not is how we would understand the, the command here. You shall not eat from the tree that is in the midst of the garden for in the day that you do it, you will surely die. Okay, this is, uh, this is um, basic to biblical law. The 10 commandments are essentially apodictic law. Uh, our relationship uh, with, uh, with our fellow men, you shall, not, uh, you shall not kill him. Don't lie to him, don't steal. You can do anything you want with your friends and neighbors and the people in your community, as long as you don't kill them, steal from them, or lie to them. Oh, and don't commit adultery and don't covet anything they've got, including their wives. Uh, all of that, the, the negatives uh, are uh, a very simple way of saying uh, you're free. You're free. Uh, go and live life. Live life fully. Live life freely. Do the things that you want to do. And in order to continue doing all of these things that you want to do, that I've designed for you to do, you need to avoid this one element. The law was not meant to restrict freedom, but to enhance it. Uh, and this is a this is a misunderstanding that uh, that many people have uh, about the nature of law. Uh, oh, I don't want to follow any laws because that just restricts my freedom. No, it doesn't. It makes uh, it makes your freedom better. Uh, uh, you're you're free to go anywhere you want on the whole lake until you fall into a hole. If you fall into a hole in the ice, then uh, you're going to get wet and cold, and it's going to mess up everybody's afternoon. Uh, how is that? How is that being mean and cruel and uh, and hating kids? I, I don't know. At any rate, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Now, God isn't making a threat here. He's is making a a statement of the reality. Uh, there's a tree here, uh, and it's uh, well labeled. It's right there on. Uh, uh, it's an important tree, uh, and so it needs to be in the garden. Uh, and you can do anything that you want with that tree except eat the fruit. Now, there's uh, a million other trees in this garden, and you can eat the fruit from all of those, but this tree, don't eat the fruit. You can play ping pong with the fruit, but don't eat the fruit. So the freedom is essentially unlimited unless you eat this fruit. In the case that that happens, you will die. Now, Adam and Eve didn't know what death was, obviously. They're going to find out. Uh, but it obviously also a bad thing. I'm not sure that Adam entirely understood it. Recognize that at this point, uh, Adam could have taken his, uh, uh, his entire scriptural collection. Thou shalt not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden for in the day that you do so, you shall surely die. Okay, it would have fit on one hand without any difficulty at all. Uh, so that was his memory verse. That was the only verse. That was all he had to memorize. And we think we've got it hard. You know, this was all he had. So then the Lord God said, and this is verse 18, and I find it fascinating. Uh, it is not good that the man should be alone. Uh, and uh, that's, it's interesting because that's the first time that the phrase uh, not good is used in the Bible. Uh, frequently throughout the rest of the Bible, we're being told that it's not good that this or that or the other thing. But, this says essentially uh, it isn't suitable. It's not complete. Uh, I'm not done yet. It's not good 
that the man should be alone. I will make him uh, a helper fit for him or a helper who fits him or a suitable helper. Uh, suitable meaning means complementary. Uh, if, uh, uh, if we have uh, two angles and they're complementary to one another, here's a, here's a straight line and there's another line. And now we've got, we've got two angles, angle A and angle B. Now angle A and angle B are not equal. Uh, they are complementary. If you add angle A to angle B, uh, you know, whatever, whatever this all is, let's uh, say this is 120 degrees and this is 60 degrees. Those of you who are still struggling with geometry may contradict me anytime you'd like. Uh, the total of the complementary angles is 180 degrees. It makes a straight line. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the, the two angles are not identical. They're not equal. They're different. Uh, but when you put them together, they form a whole. They form a straight line. The idea of uh, complement, uh, complementariness in the relationship of man and, and woman means that uh, uh, either a man or a woman by himself, by herself, is incomplete. Uh, as a man, uh, I am incomplete. Uh, I am designed to be married. Uh, God has designed me in such a way uh, that I need someone else. Uh, and a suitable helper, a suitable companion, uh, will uh, fill up in me that which I lack. And in the same way, I will fill up in her that which she lacks. The two of us each bring to the relationship something different, and yet the combination forms a whole which is complete. That's the point that uh, uh, Moses is making here. Uh, says, it's not good. I'll make a suitable helper. Uh, note the, uh, the Bible doesn't say helpmate. There is no biblical word helpmate. Uh, it, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into how the King James Version messed that up, but that's not what this says. A suitable helper. Um, now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Ah, now we get this picture of uh, 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 a, a parade of animals, which really sounds like fun. Uh, uh, the, the whole menagerie is coming past, and Adam is given an opportunity to name each one. Uh, and the uh, the parade of animals is uh, uh, not uh, not designed for Adam to pick one as uh, his best friend. You know, a big yellow lab or a a, a, a kangaroo, <laughs> a teddy bear hamster, and he's watching them all go past. Uh, and the the point is not for Adam to pick one for a friend. Uh, as much as it is for Adam to notice that all of the animals go by in pairs. Uh, so there are two elephants, and there are two horses, and there are two kangaroos, and there are uh, two birds walking past, and there, or maybe they flew past, and there's two of everything. Uh, and uh, Adam is uh, uh, smart and he's observant, and so he notices that uh, the boy-type elephant and the girl-type elephant seem to be built slightly differently. Uh, and uh, maybe he wonders what that's about. Maybe he's smart enough to figure it out. Uh, but he notices that uh, there, there seem to be two different sorts of every animal. And that's all he needed to go uh, go from. And he looked at each of these animals and each kind of animal, and he gave them names. 
and we all wish that we had those names. They're not the Latin names, of course, uh, but not. Uh, but for Adam, there was not found a suitable helper. Uh, there was not found any. Uh, and uh, uh, Adam noticed uh, the the boy elephant has a suitable helper, and that girl elephant, and the boy hamster has a uh, has a suitable companion in that girl hamster. Uh, but here I am, all by myself. In spite of all of the animals wandering around loose, uh, Adam is feeling alone. Uh, and that's, that's the way it ought to be. Uh, there was not found a helper suitable for Adam. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Okay. Great story. I mean, this is this is all story. Uh, uh, and uh, did it did it happen just so? Well, I think so. I I think so. Uh, it's um, it's not terribly important that all the details be exactly the way they were, but but I think this is the way it was. So God, or, uh, God had Adam name the animals. They paraded past. He was still a little disappointed. God put him to sleep, took the rib, made a woman. Now, uh, we should note that when God made Adam, he made him out of the soil. He made him out of dirt. When God made the woman, he made her from Adam so that uh, the relationship would be obvious. He could have made the woman from the same pile of dirt. Let's go back over to the creek and make another, make a mud woman to go with the mud man. It, he could have done it, uh, but he chose to do it this way to demonstrate the integral relationship. I mean, the essential relationship between the man and the woman. Uh, and uh, Adam figures this out immediately. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. She was taken from my side, from, from my rib, for heaven's sakes, my bone. Uh, she is flesh of my flesh. Uh, she comes out of me for, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He's called woman because she was taken out of man. The word woman in English, you can see, is closely related to the word for man, man and woman. A, uh, a woman is a, is a man who has a womb, would be another way of of say, that's a, how the, the Anglo-Saxons would say that. In most languages, there is a relationship uh, between the word for uh, uh, man and the word for woman. Uh, in Hebrew, the word man is usually ish. Uh, the uh, word for woman is usually isha, the A-H ending turns the word into a, into a feminine. So ish and isha. Now there's some other words too. Uh, Adam's name also means uh, man in the sense of mankind. Uh, so mankind is made up of male and female. Okay, uh, so he says, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so. Uh, uh, verse 24, therefore, uh, and here's the, the bottom line. When we come to a therefore in the Bible, we're always looking at it. On the basis of this story, uh, uh, Moses says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Okay, so there's there's uh, 
a phrase here, a set of phrases actually. The, uh, uh, the man shall leave his father and his mother. Uh, there's some going that's involved here. Uh, when I work with, uh, with young couples uh, who are uh, planning to get married, one of the things I tell them is that it's important to leave home. Uh, and obviously you're, you're, you're not going to try to set up housekeeping in, uh, in your mom's basement. Uh, you, you've got to move out. Uh, and it's best if you don't merely move across the street or across town. It's better if you go someplace far enough away that the first time you have trouble, which you will within the first month or so, you'll have an argument. Uh, and it's important that you be far enough away that it's not easy to run home. Uh, you've got to set up housekeeping in your own place uh, and, and become your own people. It's actually quite important. Uh, when, uh, uh, when Donna and I were first married, uh, we moved uh, about 500 kilometers away uh, from uh, Spokane, where uh, we were married, where we had uh, both grown up, uh, to uh, Portland in the uh, state of Oregon, about 500 kilometers away. It was so far away that it was, uh, it was a long trip to come home. It took us all day driving. And in those days, that was a, it was a long drive. That's coming up. Uh, this Friday is 49 years <laughs> since since we moved away. We we left, uh, and I actually think it's important uh, for uh, young people to set up housekeeping on their own, uh, far enough away that they can't easily run home. Now close enough that you can make phone calls, but you know far enough away that you're not right there. Uh, if it's at all possible. In some circumstances, that can't be done. And then you have to work around it in some other ways. Uh, but the leaving is important. The, the second term here, cleaving, is a very interesting word and shall cleave to his wife. Uh, my English Standard Version says, and he shall hold fast to his wife. The uh, the Hebrew word here is uh, is fun uh, because it is uh, it is a term that usually describes the work of glue. Uh, okay, just what I said, glue, G L U E. Uh, back in the day, uh, I'm talking 60 years ago when I was a boy. Uh, my father taught me. Uh, a lot of things. He taught me how to work with wood, among other things. Uh, my father was not a wealthy man and he didn't have a big shop. Uh, he had simple hand tools, but he, he enjoyed doing uh, some forms of woodwork by hand with, his, uh, with a block plane and a hand saw and uh, uh, hammers and chisels. And, and he showed me how to do a lot of things. And I remember him making pieces of furniture and pieces of cabinet and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and when I got old enough to understand what, what he was doing down there, he showed me uh, how, to make a, uh, uh, how to make a proper joint, you know, two pieces of wood. And we, he did it. He used his saw and he used his chisel to make mortise and tenon joint. A uh, uh, mortise is the is the slot that's cut in a piece of wood, and the tenon is the uh, the bit that fits into the slot. And we put these at corners and shelves and that. So mortise and tenon. And in the mortise and tenon joint, uh, uh, you would take some glue to hold the joint together. The glue that my father made uh, was uh, uh, made from uh, animal hooves, uh, skin and uh, uh, hoof and horn and that kind of thing uh, is, uh, 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 I don't know what it, uh, what they did, is rendered down and it forms uh, uh, yellowish flakes 
And back in the day, we called this weldwood glue. And you would take these yellow flakes and mix it with a little bit of solvent and warm it up over a, uh, my father used an alcohol lamp. Uh, you would warm this up over, over an alcohol lamp until it, uh, it, it turned into a kind of a paste. And then you would take a, a brush, take that brush and brush the, the glue onto the surfaces that you were trying to uh, join. And you quickly put them together because as, as, the, as the glue lost temperature, it would, it would harden up. But because it was hot when it went on, uh, that glue soaked very rapidly into the surrounding wood. And as you put the two pieces together, you put them together and you put them on an, under a clamp and you let that joint uh, set up for 24 hours. Uh, when you come back, that, that joint has become uh, an integral thing. Uh, there's actually a chemical reaction that takes place in the fibers of wood uh, between the glue and the wood fibers so that the joint actually becomes stronger than the wood on either side of the joint. Uh, my father demonstrated this to me one day uh, when he had made a joint uh, the previous day or several days before. And, uh, and he told me that this is this was all wrong and we're going to have to try to break this and start over. I said, well, how do you do that? And, uh, and he showed me, uh, uh, you, you take this, this joint that we've made and you bash it against the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the work table, the bench, hit it hard against the bench. And uh, uh, when I did that, uh, it took several swings uh, and I finally shattered the joint. Uh, and then he said, now John, you pick up those pieces and have a, have a good close look at what has actually happened there. And he kept pushing me on this until I understood that what had broken was not the joint, but the wood on one side. I had, I had shattered the piece of wood. The remaining piece of wood, the unbroken one, was just as it had been, except for the nasty shape of the glue soaked into the wood of the broken piece. So the joint didn't break. The wood broke. When uh, when we do the traditional marriage ceremony, which is something that I prefer to do, I, uh, I believe in using the, the old fashioned Book of Common Prayer marriage ceremony. Uh, and I, I, I pronounce the, uh, the kids man and wife. And then I say, what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. In other words, you can't break this. I pronounced you man and wife. You are man and wife now forever in God's eyes. In man's eyes, maybe this is a, this is a, a mere convenience, a contract. Uh, but in God's eyes, you are joined to one another. Like two pieces of wood are, are welded together with uh, classic weldwood glue. Uh, and uh, nothing is going to break that joint except the death of one or the other. That, that's how important marriage is to God. So what God has done here in the garden uh, is the, the very first marriage ceremony. Uh, Eve was presented to Adam. He recognized that this was right. Uh, 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 for this reason, a man shall leave and cleave and the two become one. 
Now, everybody knows, every, uh, married people all know that there are still two of them. <laughs> you know, Donna went off to take care of the grandkids. They're playing trumpets and stuff, uh, which is really wonderful. Uh, and I stay here to uh, teach. Uh, and I enjoy this. And so I'm doing my thing and Donna is doing her thing. We're two people. And yet, in a very real way, we are one. Uh, the, later on, we're going to, uh, to see um, uh, God described as one. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word one used in Deuteronomy 6.4 is exactly the same as the word used in Genesis uh, 2. Uh, when, when we talk about one flesh, we're talking about one made up of parts. Two people become one, one couple, uh, one, one marriage, one, one flesh. This is not not merely the physical relationship, but in, in so many ways, we, uh, we have both contributed so much to the one relationship. Uh, there, there is a, a spiritual to go with the, the physical that is all part of uh, one mystical reality. And so the two become one flesh. The man and his wife, were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now this is the last time in the whole history of the world uh, when uh, people could get away with wandering around loose in a garden without their clothes on. Uh, and uh, there, there were nobody else around and it wouldn't have mattered actually if there were because there was no sin. So the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed because there was no break between the man and his wife and God. It was all good. And that sets us up for the beginning of chapter three, which is the introduction of sin in the world. Uh, and as we get into chapter three, I want you to think about something for between now and Wednesday. Uh, uh, at uh, uh, the end of chapter two, Everything is good. A man and his wife, they're both naked and they're not ashamed. Everybody's happy and God is in the garden and walking around and, and all of the animals are happy and the fruit is grown on the trees. At the end of chapter one, God said, behold, it is really good. And the only bad thing that God found during this whole time was that the man was alone. And so now he's fixed that deficiency and everything is good. Everything is just absolutely wonderful. And then at the beginning of chapter three, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that God had made. So we're introduced to the serpent, who I'll just tell you is the, uh, the character who stands in for Satan. The serpent is a snake and the snake stands in for Satan. And by the time we get to 3-1, Satan has already fallen. So when did that happen? How did that happen? Uh, on, uh, on Wednesday, I'll, I'll walk through some of the approaches to the fall of Satan. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the, the simple answer is we don't know. Uh, the Bible doesn't really tell us. That, that's the simple answer. Uh, I always hate it when that's the answer, but that, that really is the correct answer on this one. Um, between now and, uh, and Wednesday, think about that. Think about what it must have been like uh, for, uh, for Adam and Eve to, to have this uh, solid, healthy relationship in a perfect place, in a sinless universe, in perfect relationship to God. And what it must have meant 
for them to break that relationship. So we see that the chapter two is the setup for chapter three. And in fact, uh, from a literary point of view, there is no break in the narrative from chapter two to chapter three. They're all part of one story. Uh, so the, the development of sin in the world as we get into chapter three uh, is all a part of the same story. So here comes man, and by the way, sin. Uh, yeah, the, the very earliest theological message is that in the presence of absolute perfection, sin is a possibility, and sin really happened. Sin entered the world, and thus death entered the world through one man. But as we saw in Romans several months ago, uh, God has a solution for that in the new Adam, who becomes the head of a new race. And we're all children of God and joint heirs with Jesus. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to quit there. I'm going to see if I can, I'm going to unmute us all so that, so that we can say bye-bye. This has been fun. Uh, I'm glad we could do this. We'll uh, we'll come back on Wednesday. Yeah, I'm getting lots of uh, lots of echoes. <laughs> okay, Oscar. Oscar. Good night, Dad. Thank you so much, Doctor John. Dad, yeah. Thank you very much. Donna will be back in a little bit, and we'll uh, we'll thank get together so on Facebook. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. We'll see you on Wednesday. Love you all. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Uh -oh. <laughs>